In 1968, the city of Newcastle upon Tyne, England, was shaken by a series of tragic events that would leave a lasting impact on the community and spark a nationwide conversation about childhood, criminality, and the nature of evil. This is the story of Mary Bell, an 11 year old girl whose actions would challenge society's perceptions of innocence and accountability in ways previously unimagined. The narrative begins in the spring of that year in the Scotswood area of Newcastle, a working class community where families lived and worked under the shadow of economic hardship. It was in this setting that Mary Bell would commit two heinous acts that seemed beyond comprehension for someone so young. The first incident occurred on May the 25th, 1968, when Mary Bell alongside her friend, Norma Bell, who was of no relation, led a four-year-old boy named Martin Brown to an abandoned house. The details of what transpired were harrowing. Martin was found dead and the cause was initially a mystery as there was no obvious signs of violence. The community was stunned and while suspicion momentarily touched upon Mary and Norma, the idea that children could be capable of such an act was at the time dismissed. However, the unease only deepened when two months later, another boy, three month old Brian Howe, was found dead on a wasteland this time with clear evidence of strangulation and further disturbing signs of violence that pointed unmistakably to a deliberate act of violence. This was the second tragedy that brought Mary and Norma into the sphere of serious investigation. This investigation revealed chilling details. Mary and Norma had been seen with Brian on the day of his death and forensic evidence combined with Mary's incriminating behaviour and contradictory statements led to their arrest. What followed was a trial that gripped the nation as the courtrooms heard testimonies of Mary's unsettling fascination with death and her role in the killings. Mary Bell was found guilty of manslaughter on the grounds of diminished responsibility, a verdict that reflected the court's struggle to reconcile her young age with the gravity of her crimes. Norma was acquitted, deemed to be under Mary's influence. The case raised profound questions about nature versus nurture, the capacity for children to understand the concept of morality and the appropriate way to deal with juvenile offenders. Mary was sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's prison, an indefinite sentence that left her future uncertain. Over the years, her case has been revisited in discussions about criminal psychology, rehabilitation and the legal system's handling of young offenders. Mary was eventually released in 1980 after serving 12 years and has lived under a series of pseudonyms ever since. The Mary Bell case remains is one of the most disturbing and complex in British criminal history. It challenges us to confront uncomfortable questions about innocence, evil and the capacity for redemption. Above all, it serves as a dark reminder of the mysteries that can lie hidden in the human heart regardless of age. Suddenly, our bands seem to be murdering our bands and it was almost too much for people in a very caring city to cope with. This made the whole city, in a sense, cry in on itself. Scotswood, where Mary Bell grew up in the 1960s, had barely changed since the war. It was a slum area, with all the social problems that come with years of neglect and deprivation. There was a lot of uh, notorious families in the area who were well known to the police for drunkenness, minor petty crime and that sort of thing. There are a lot of uh, pubs in that area, a legacy from the days of the factory, the heavy industrial area, and it was common for husbands to be drunk. And calls to the police uh, were very frequent for to respond to fights in the house and the streets, and it was very common indeed. Mary lived in a generally bad area, practically uh, every other house uh, uh, housed a prostitute of some sort and she, 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 that was the kind of environment she was in. I used to often feel sorry for the respectable people who had to live amongst them really. It was a constant battle uh, trying to determine who was committing a crime and who wasn't. In the back-to-back -back estates of Scotswood, children like Mary Bell were left to play unsupervised for hours in the streets. It was a time of growing prosperity in Britain, but the new wealth never came to Newcastle's West End. There was poverty, 
the mams used to keep the coal in the kitchens because they wouldn't put it in the bunker outside in case it got taken. They wouldn't hang washing or anything outside because it would get taken. The majority of houses, they didn't have much, just bits and pieces of furniture. But they never, uh, it didn't seem to bother them. They just used to get on with it. Newcastle was in the grip of massive redevelopment. The worst slums were being knocked down to make way for new high-rise flats. The demolition sites of Scotswood's Rat Alley became a children's playground as the city changed by the day. It was a very rough area. You get the odd empty house and you would get derelict houses down there. Um, and kids used to go and play in the derelict houses. But seeing that it was very close, you could literally leave doors open. You could go to bed and, and leave your front door or your back door open. If the children got into mischief, the neighbours would check them. You know, I mean, it wasn't like, you're my child, there's nobody allowed to check you or tell you off because you're my child. Everybody was everybody else's eyes and ears. That's the way, way it was. It was just so, so friendly. Nobody had anything, so you didn't have this fight for, have I got the right gear? You know, there was nothing like that. They got one present at Christmas, one on their birthday and there was no one-upmanship. For all its community spirit, Scotswood was notorious for social problems and difficult families. Mary Bell's childhood had been full of unhappiness. She was neglected. Both her parents were often away. The family lived in the White House Road. It was the roughest part of a rough estate. Her mother, Betty, was depressive and erratic. On one occasion, she tried to have Mary adopted, yet on another, she rejected her family's offers to take her daughter off her hands. Betty had a reputation in the area. We knew about Mary's mum. I mean, the whole estate knows about Mary's mum. Not just to go away for days, or something, just go away for weeks. And basically, it was just known as, you know, the lady of the night sort of thing. In other words, prostitution. Mary spent much time on her own in the house when her mother was out with clients. Billy, her father, was a petty criminal and a drunkard. Well, Billy Bell, Mary's father, was well known to the police. He was a big, rough chap, gypsy type uh, in appearance, a muscular type of man, uh, not the kind of man one would have liked to meet on a dark night, certainly. but. Uh, when one considered that Mary was brought up in a household like that, what chance could she possibly have had? Mary's disturbed behaviour was well known in the playground. I was in the same class as Mary, and that's when I used to play with her. The first thing that comes into your mind about Mary is her eyes. She's got very, very distinctive blue eyes, very attractive blue eyes, I suppose, but they are very distinctive and they can fix you with a stare. She had such a heavy dark fringe and the blue eyes, the piercing eyes, she would stay and it's just like got fixed on you, you know it. You knew you were in, tr in for trouble. She could be sort of fine, playing away one minute, doing the things normal kids do, and then she maybe get something, some of that kid might upset her. And that's when the change would start and she could become quite aggressive. From nine year old, where I can remember, I was frightened of her. So what you did was you kept away from her. But the situations where she would come to you or who you were playing with. So you just had to like watch. You had to be very, very careful of her. You wouldn't have turned your back on her. Her eyes would go, she would act funny, her head would shake, and then she would know how to get by the throat. And the one time that I'll never ever forget the little girl I used to play with, she had her hands so tight around her throat, her eyes, she, her face was red. She was, her lips were going a different colour, she was choking, but my sister that was in the middle, middle-aged sister, she got her off. Mary's teachers at Delaval Road also became aware that she seemed to have a sadistic streak. I met Mary when a, a child in my class came in one morning and had a mark on her cheek. When I asked her what it was, she said that Mary had stubbed out a cigarette on her cheek. And um, when I sent for Mary, 
along came this little girl and um, I, pointed, I said to her, have you done this? And Mary said, oh yes. And, and go, oh, I said, well, well um, I, I'm just sorry for what you've done. She, yes. Although Mary's violent behaviour was noticed by her teachers, tragically nothing was done to address her problems. And at home she was exposed to the grim world of her mother's prostitution and her father's drunkenness. Mary was influenced by all of these things. She saw um, very strange behaviour going on uh, through her own mother's actions and by her father's actions and by the local community. She was deeply embedded in a sort of petty crime environment, an environment in which violence against each other was something that was almost acceptable and the norm. Next door to Mary Bell in White House Road, there lived another girl called Bell who was no relation. She was Norma Bell, two years older than Mary, but much less bright. Mary was always the leader. Because she had some followers on, she felt maybe led to do things that maybe she wouldn't have done on her own. But she could dominate people quite easily. If Mary was to tell Norma to jump off the time bridge, she would jump off the time bridge. That was one of the jokes at the time. It was a question of the two wrong people coming together, one to bolster up the courage of the other one probably, one the leader nearly always, and one um, weaker intellectually. And this was the case with uh, Norma. Bell, uh, easily led, uh, nothing near as bright as uh, Mary Bell. The children of Scotswood had come to fear Mary and Norma, with some reason. On Saturday, the 11th of May, 1968, Mary and Norma had picked up a boy aged three and taken him to buy some sweets. Sometime later, he was found wandering, dazed and bleeding. The police and an ambulance were called, but no action was taken. The next day, the mother of a local girl complained to the police that Mary Bell had attempted to strangle her daughter whilst playing in a sandpit. But once more, despite all the signs, nothing was done to take Mary in hand. Norma pinned us down and Mary had grabbed us by the neck and start like, strangling us. And then she was had a hand here and it's just getting the sand and then pouring at my mouth and it couldn't go in quick enough and she tried to stuff her fingers down basically to go it further down and obviously I was terrified and I think Norma was a little bit frightened when she seen what Mary was doing because Norma jumped up and by that time she had jumped up and I managed to struggle and get free and run home. After the attack on Pauline, the police were called, but no further action was taken. Little Pauline had not told the full story. I was terrified of telling the police everything. I know I didn't tell them everything. I know I told them I'd been, like, strangled. But I didn't mention the sound, because I was frightened. I was frightened of the after effects in case she got a hold of us afterwards. And it haunts us. Two weeks later, on Saturday the 25th of May, Martin Brown, a four-year-old Scotswood boy, was playing outside with his friends. He was quite tall for his age and well-built, blonde curly hair, blue eyes and eyelashes. You've seen nothing like them. Uh, he wasn't an angel, he was always in the mischief. He, was one of these, he had a very cheeky face and he was mischievous. Um, like when he decided to have a swimming pool in the bedroom when he filled the bottom drawer full of water and were flooded. <laughs> Things like that I used to get up to. It was just beautiful. What more can you see? Same as what every mother thinks about a child. It was quite usual for young children to be out playing in the derelict buildings of Rat Alley, and Martin's family weren't concerned at first by his long absence. But at five o'clock, a neighbour called to say that he had had an accident. I ran up to the houses and I seen a crowd of people standing outside. And um, this guy, he had Martin in his hands. 
and he was grey. And he felt cold, so I took my cardigan off and I put it around him. And this man, there was tears running down his face. And I said, is he all right? He says, I don't know, I don't know. And at that, two ambulance men just rushed past, grabbed him, and run past us again and put him into the ambulance. Martin Brown was taken from the derelict house to the local Newcastle hospital and pronounced dead on arrival. I was devastated because he didn't look as if he was dead. There was not a mark on him. There was a little trickle of blood down on his face, but that was it. Because Martin's body had been found in mysterious circumstances, upstairs inside an abandoned house, the police were called in to investigate the cause of death. Uh, at first I thought maybe some tablets, but that's just because there were some tablets lying around. The previous tenant of the house, which was then empty, had left these tablets around the floor. Um, and uh, the, the pathologist carried out an extensive examination of the boy's throat, but couldn't uh, come to the conclusion that it was violent uh, or uh, uh, not uh, other than a natural death. There was a few theories, like he's maybe getting to the top of the stairs and, and being frightened to come down because he once fell down the stairs when he was very little. And I said, well, he could have sort of gotten a shock. The star called Martin the Rat Alley Boy, which really hurt. It, it did, it really hurt that his name was linked to rats. You know, I mean, it, it's a terrible thing to do to a small child. Well, but I'm absolutely certain that that, that was Mary's doing because Norma presented as a very uh, pathetic child and uh, Mary obviously dominated her. That same Monday, Mary Bell went to school as usual and wrote in her school news book, There were crowds of people beside an old house. I asked what was the matter. There has been a boy who just lay down and died. She drew a picture of the dead body of Martin Brown and next to it, a bottle and a pill, by which she wrote, Tablet. Mary also showed a workman finding the body. This went unnoticed for weeks. Mary and Norma used to go to my sister's uh, house to babysit. They were all right to talk to. But after I lost Martin, every time I went up and they were sitting in, in my sister's house, I would ask questions like, how do you feel? Um, are you missing them? Which I thought was concern on their part for me. You know, I thought, isn't this nice to really care how I feel? Just before Martin was buried, they came to my house and asked if they could see him. And I knew that they knew he was dead. So I just looked like blank at them, you know. And I said to, uh, the youngest of the two, Mary, she was littler than the other one. I said, wait, well, you can't see Martin, Martin's dead. She says, oh, she says, I know he's dead. She says, I want to see him in his coffin. With that, I slammed the door on her face, in her face and I just collapsed behind the door and my husband had to come get us and he had to send for the doctor. Two months passed that summer in Newcastle without incident, but the case of Martin Brown was not forgotten. Without a known cause, his death was blamed on the dangerous conditions in the Rat Alley slums. Oh, Newcastle reacted to this situation in, in perhaps the traditional ways of shock and horror. The murder had occurred in, in a part of the city which was being demolished for slum clearance reasons. And the local population marched to complain that this was not being done properly and effectively. And the strange thing was, the little figure at the front of the march carrying one of the banners was Mary Bell. There was a young killer at large who, despite all the signs, the notes, the news book, the previous violent incidents, was not apprehended. Tragically, Another death was inevitable. On Wednesday, the 31st of July, Brian Howe, a three-year-old, was, like so many children in Scotswood, playing unsupervised in the streets. 
he went to watch the demolition of derelict houses in Rat Alley. A little later, Mary Bell picked him up and took him off with Norma to play on a nearby patch of waste ground called the Tin Lizzie. He was never seen alive again. We heard that he had gone missing. And obviously, we didn't connect it with uh, Mary Bell. Uh, we just thought that somebody had took him off, you know, or he was lost, wherever. Um, and it wasn't till later that night, and we had all the police cars. We looked out, and there was some big lamps on. The place was totally lit up. It was like a Christmas tree, you know, where you could see, the, actually see the people milling around on, on the Tin Lizzy. And you could hear the dogs bark, and so we knew it was the police. And I says, what's happened? She says, I found little Brian Howe, and he's been murdered. And, oh, totally devastated. I mean, I, I never give a second thought that, that it had any connection with Mason. When I got there, there was uniformed police officers there. I had the area cordoned off and examined the boy. Uh, the little boy had fair blonde curly hair. He was obviously appeared to be dead, uh, so I did all the necessary things such as obtaining the services of uh, the doctor and the photographer and notified Mr Burroughs, who would be uh, eventually in charge of the investigation. I was headed to see Eddie at this time. On in unusual murders, I was called out, well, practically every time. And this was a call early in the early morning, I think it was about half past one or two o'clock, called to this scene because the boy had been missing for some time, but by that time had been found uh, lying semi-spread-eagled, really, uh, half-naked, uh, lying amongst the concrete and the um, bushes. I noticed that there had been snippets of the boy's hair cut off and lying nearby and his uh, little legs showed that uh, there was puncture wounds in the calves of the legs and other areas of the legs. Uh, and it seemed to indicate that perhaps the, uh, the scissors or whatever had been used to cut uh, the boy's hair had also been used to puncture uh, his legs. The first thing one noticed was the um, unusual cut marks to the legs. Um, first time I'd ever seen that, of course, and uh, it, one immediately could see that they'd been caused after death. I, I gained the impression at, at the time that the person responsible must have been rather young because of the gentleness of the uh, death. It required a post-mortem examination, and that's, that follows straight away. The post-mortem showed that Brian Howe had been strangled and that the cut marks were naive attempts to leave initials on the body. The pathologist concluded it was the work of a child. Given the similarities with the death of little Martin Brown, the police now reopened his case too and went to see his mother in Scotswood. They said, well, you better sit down, we've got something to tell you. And then uh, there is with a bombshell that uh, they'd looked back into Martin's death and they weren't 100% certain, but they were 60% sure that Martin had been murdered as well couldn't believe it. To the horror of the local community, the police now announced that they were searching for a child, and amid the hundreds of suspects, one child, Mary Bell, seemed to want to draw attention to herself. Whenever I held, or anyone else held, a conference, this one girl's face kept appearing, uh, listening intently to everything that was being said. You, you, one couldn't miss her. If you, if you tried, she, she, she was so obvious, pushing herself forward to listen to what was being said. It was common knowledge amongst the children of Scotswood that Mary and Norma had been up to no good. Mary had already boasted in the playground that she had strangled a boy, and many had experienced the little girl's assaults at first hand. I think everybody half thought, eh, well, the new. Well, everybody who went to Delver Road School knew what she was like. I think everybody sort of around that area was waiting for something to happen because of what she used to get up to. 
After uh, a conference and discussion, we decided it was time to have a word with Mary Bell, and Mr. Dobson and I went to the house. And so far as I recall it, on the first occasion, Mr. Bell, the father, uh, he refused to let us see the uh, young girl, and he had a big Alsatian dog which he threatened to uh, set upon us. But there had been another witness at the waste ground where the murder of Brian Howe took place, a nine-year-old boy with a mental age of four. He had seen everything. There you had a witness who knew really what had gone on and explained to me what had gone on. And it appears that uh, Mary's method was to massage the necks of the boys and tell them they had a sore throat and that she'd make it better. And her grip tightened and tightened until uh, it caused the death. Given the new witness, Harvey Burroughs ordered his officers to go down to Scotswood and bring Mary and Norma in for questioning. The police consulted a child psychiatrist to get advice on how best to treat the children. They wanted me to see the children who were concerned, I suppose in a diagnostic way, because they had had suspicions. The school had had suspicions because they behaved in a curious way in the school. They brought me photographs of the little murdered boy. Tragic, you know, a little golden-haired laddie lying there dead. It was very trying, very upsetting. With Mary, it was difficult to get her to relax. You can understand why. I mean, she knew she was suspected. And I gather that when they went to her house, she sat on the man's knee, he was not her father, and said, send for my solicitor. You know, she was quite tough in that way from the very beginning right through to, to the end of the trial it, it was a denial on Mary's part although the police clearly were wanting to ask Mary about the allegations that they had to put to her uh, and Mary did deal with the allegations uh, Mary had other things on her mind as well and for instance she would wonder about her mother whether her mother was going to come to see her or where her mother was uh, she had an Alsatian dog and she would ask about that. When we got off the subject of, of the loss of the little boy, she began to talk about her friendship with Norma and how they had been happy together. And, uh, and we were full of laughter that day, she said. And I think the day she was referring to was the day on which this child died. In the evenings, Mary and her friend Norma were taken into care in Newcastle. Many of those who came into contact with Mary grew fond of this vivacious and intelligent girl who was in such trouble. One must have felt sorry for her at the time, there's no question about that, because uh, she was a young girl, she was only 11 years of age, she didn't realise the enormity of her predicament, she didn't realise what she was facing in future life, and during the course of the investigation I frequently took in bags of apples for both her and Norma Joyce, they were only kids and they really didn't know what was happening, I don't suppose, at that age. At Westgate Road Station, where she was interviewed, Mary Bell astonished the police with the sophisticated way in which she parried their questions. I used to think she had a, like a computer brain. When you one put a question to Mary, she would start answering almost before you'd finish the question. And then she'd continue and answer the next four or five questions still unasked. This was a strange thing. It's rather like someone going into a maze, and the first question put her into the maze, and her mind told her she could get through that maze and come out the other side unscathed. Despite her denials, the evidence against Mary began to mount up. The scissors used to mark the body of Brian Howe were found near the scene and the police now made the connection between Mary and the notes they had found after Martin Brown's death two months previously. More evidence came from the girls' school. Eric Foster, Mary Bell's teacher, had always been fond of the intelligent little ten-year-old in his class. After he learned of her arrest, he decided to go back over her daily news book to check if she had written anything about the deaths of the two boys. She had, extraordinarily, on the cover was a headline, 
boy found dead in old house. The report was inside. It was written on the um, Monday after the weekend about how this little boy had uh, gone into these houses and just lay down and died. And when the police looked at the book and they saw the drawing at the bottom, there, were, there was the tablets arrowed, and the police said, well, of course, that was never disclosed to anyone. So she must have been there to have seen it. The news book was proof that she had been involved. On the 8th of August, 1968, the police charged Mary Bell and her friend Norma Bell with the murder of Brian Howe. Four months later, on the 5th of December, the full trial of Mary and her friend Norma began at Newcastle Assizes. Although the case had many similarities with the murder of James Bulger 25 years later, there was none of the sensational reporting that would be expected today. Indeed, because it involved a child killer, the BBC and ITN banned the story from their daytime news bulletins. Both Mary and Norma claimed they were innocent and blamed each other for the killings. And as with the Bulger case later, many felt a Crown Court the wrong place for the law to deal with children. Because it was a very serious offence, it had to go through the normal criminal processes and, uh, and appear in an open court. And all the, the paraphernalia of, of counsel for the defence and counsel for the prosecution and the like. The whole thing focused on these two tiny little figures with dark hair, what seemed to be big dark eyes, looking out into the world. Now this just was totally unsuitable for examining the, the, the truths in this situation. And the children were unable to properly respond to this situation. There was no chance of it being a really just trial. But some effort was made to ease the situation of the little girls. The trial judge set the scene quite well by deciding that the lawyers representing Mary and anybody else there should sit with the client and, and therefore remove some of the impersonal uh, feel that there might otherwise have been. And, and even that, which may seem quite a small thing in relation to the, the whole trial procedure, uh, helped enormously because Mary was able to speak to me whenever she wanted, I could speak to her whenever I wanted. There was no question of dealing at arm's length, and the jury would be aware of that more relaxed atmosphere as well. Seeing her sitting there, you would wonder how on earth she could be involved in any crime. She looked innocent. She showed no, no emotion uh, and gave her answers uh, straightforwardly. Uh, but constantly maintain that she was not guilty of either of the killings. But there was an incident when she was being cross-examined by Rudolf Lahns. When she did become very upset, she was asked whether she had, and I'm not sure whether it was attempted to strangle a pigeon, or had actually killed a pigeon by strangulation. And that upset her greatly. And uh, we had to have a break while she recovered from this. The trial took nine days. As time passed, it became ever more apparent to the court that Mary Bell was, in some way, abnormal, quite unlike other children of her age. She had certain things that one felt were missing in her emotions. That was my impression. She was quite, uh, I'm not going to say hard, but she was impervious. She never, of course, admitted to having done any of these things. The other little girl was quite easy. She was relaxed. She was not very bright. I was very sorry for her. She had been entirely, I think, the lead one. The two girls were very different in personality. Mary, very bright and sharp, and could answer back to the council when they questioned her. She could make quite witty little remarks. 
The other girl was not as bright and I think was completely overawed by the setting. And in a sense, the court almost separated the two and said, therefore, the bright one must have done it and the duller one probably didn't. There was no doubt in the court, given all the evidence, that Mary had strangled the two little boys, despite her denials. The verdict of the jury depended on the findings of the psychiatrists who examined Mary Bell. The doctor's conclusions were unanimous, that Mary lacked the ordinary feelings of a child her age and was, in their view at the time, a psychopath. I did not get any feeling of remorse or anxiety. I really had something behind the glass, really. You see, most children you, you get to know and they talk and you get a feeling about what sort of a child they are, at least in my particular job you have to. But I don't think that with Mary one could do this. Oh, she was an intelligent child. Oh, yes. Uh, she'd got it all worked out. Uh, she was devious. And uh, that, but that's very often a characteristic of a psychopath, is that they have considerable intelligence and resource and cunning. And she used those to the full. Given the medical diagnosis, Mary Bell was found guilty of manslaughter. Norma Bell was acquitted on the grounds that she was simple-minded and had been dominated by her friend. She left the court and returned to her home and family in Scotswood. Mary was sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure. Well, Mary was in a state then of very, very great shock, and understandably so. And she did um, turn to me in tears, and I was just next to her, and I put my arm around her in an attempt to comfort her in this situation. I felt as if, yeah, that's, that's just, that, that's the way it should be. And I hated that girl. I hated both them girls. I hated them for what they'd done to me. And if I could have gotten a hold of them at the time, I would have done what majority of people would have done. I would have most likely been in the court the next week. But having been found guilty of manslaughter, the authorities' duty was to rehabilitate and not to punish Mary Bell. The newspapers agreed. Even The Sun, in contrast to its attitude to the Bulger case 25 years later, called for a humane and caring approach to the little girl killer. But the problem was that her case, at that time, was unique. She was too young to be the subject of a hospital order under the Mental Health Act. That wasn't an option. And one of the strange features of this trial was that after she had been convicted, it wasn't apparent that anybody had really applied their minds as to where she was going to spend the first night after sentence. After much toing and froing, it was decided that she should go to an approved school with secure accommodation, Red Bank in Lancashire. Here Mary would be looked after and given the attention and even love she craved and lacked at home. Mary was, and I believe still is, a very attractive personality, a very lively mind and with quite a lot of gifts in the artistic field and, and the capacity to write well. and and relate well, which was really quite remarkable coming from the background that she did do. And I think that all sorts of people, professionals and lawyers and others involved in, in her care, were quite taken by this. And this, in a sense, was, was very fortunate because what it did mean is that nobody was prepared just to let her case lie fallow. After the dust had settled, those involved reflected on what had caused a Newcastle girl, only just 11, to kill two boys in her neighbourhood. There was little desire for retribution and much for understanding. Most blamed Mary's behaviour on her environment and the fact that her mother was a prostitute. 
In the haunted eyes of Mary Bell, many of those who came into contact with her saw not the evil of a psychopathic murderer, but the look of fear and devastation of a victim herself. I felt sorry for her as much as anything else because of the background. And with only having probably one room in the house where uh, Mary, uh, Mary's mother took people, uh, the child was bound to see everything that went on. I, I know uh, that she did see everything that went on between uh, Mary's mother and the clients that she took there. As time passed, Mary's mother Betty became a frequent visitor at Red Bank. Behind the smiles of the mother and daughter lay an anguished relationship of guilt and resentment. Mary's mother Betty is alleged to have specialised in sadomasochism. Some thought this must have influenced Mary. Certainly she would have seen on a daily basis physical uh, violence between adults and, and between adults and children. And I'm pretty certain she would have known perhaps even sexual violence and, and uh, sexual attacks between adults and children as part of the norm. Whilst Mary was in Red Bank, her mother received a letter blaming her for ruining her life. Please, ma'am, put my tiny mind at ease. Tell judge and jury on your knees. They will listen to your cry of pleas. The guilty one is you, not me. I'm sorry it has to be this way. We'll both cry and you will go away. Tell them you are guilty, please. So then, ma'am, I'll be free. Your daughter, me. Betty Bell herself gave a television interview in 1972, four years after the killings. She was by then a broken woman, relying on drink and drugs for peace of mind. Now, Betty, are you saying that your daughter is innocent? No, I'm not saying she's innocent. But something must have made her do these things. Yes, something possibly must have made her do these things. And what was it about her life and her family you think that could have driven her to these things? Maybe it's the arguments between my husband and myself might have had some inflict on her. I, I don't know. Have you been very despairing sometimes? And very despairing, very, very lot of, under a lot of strain, stress and grief. For my daughter. I think the relationship between Mary and her mother was one of the key factors here, where there was really little or no emotional attachment at all. And I think this made the child really feel she had little or no emotional attachment to human beings around her. And therefore, nasty things could be done to them because it didn't mean anything. So much depends upon what happens to anybody in the first year of their life, or two years. You see, if they never exposed to loving attention in those early years, they don't learn about love, and they don't learn about warm emotions. And so, maybe if she had been exposed to loving care from the start, things would have been different. The only reason I can think for Mary doing this is it gave her a sense of power over young children and there may be some significance about the fact that it was two young boys but regardless of that she would not have been able to uh, have done that to a person much older than four because they had been too strong for her Mary Bell spent 12 years locked away six of them in Red Bank's special unit the only girl with 22 boys while there, she was occasionally treated by therapists and continued to blame others for the crimes. David Martin, a psychologist, came to know Mary at Red Bank. I, I don't know that she ever acknowledged uh, her offences, certainly not to me, not in the slightest, denied them. Um, almost didn't trouble to deny them, if you see what I mean. It was almost as though, you know, this just, this isn't, this isn't the relevant agenda, you know, um, dismissive of them. Even though she never admitted to the killing of the two boys, as she grew up, Mary was no longer considered to pose any threat to the community. 
1978, she was moved to Ascombe Grange Open Prison. Two years later, she was released, aged 23. There was no public outcry. Since then, she has built a new life with a new name. By law, her identity is protected from disclosure. She had come out of it as a very balanced, sensible person and has sorted out her life with some ups and downs in it and I think has become uh, a very good citizen. Now, that shows it can be achieved. It can be achieved if time is taken over it and the skills are put in there and there is a real exchange of affection and interest in the person concerned, not simply as a case, but as a person. But the people of Scotswood in Newcastle have never overcome the trauma of the case of Mary Bell. The killing of two little boys by an 11-year-old girl seemed to mark a turning point from an old world of comfortable innocence where children could play safely on the streets to a world of high-rise flats, increasing crime and an ever-present fear of lurking violence. Even to this day, it's a name that's not forgotten. It can't be. I mean, I know I'll not forget um, because it left an impression in, a, in a, an impressionable age. Things changed, doors were closed, children didn't play out so much. Children were taken to school and picked up from school whereas beforehand they'd gone themselves. I mean, the other cases that have come, that have happened since then, um, they'll always be remembered as well, but for some reason, because this seemed to be the first prominent case, I don't think it ever will be forgotten. 25 years after the case of Mary Bell, the killing of a toddler by two boys in Liverpool seemed to have many similarities. Two children, egging each other on, had led off a smaller boy and killed him. But the Bulger case caused much greater public outrage. The video images had given it a far greater immediacy, and the violence of the killing seemed more shocking. Yet, like Mary Bell, the two young killers, Robert Thompson and John Venables, had a troubled and unhappy past. Like Mary, they too had shown signs of disturbance which were never picked up. As time passes and we learn more about what causes children to behave in such terrible and extreme ways, one abiding truth emerges. That from birth, children must have the loving affection and care of those who look after them. In a world where such attention cannot easily be given, the tragedies which afflicted Newcastle and Liverpool will come to haunt us again. The Mary Bell case serves as a stark reminder of the complexities inherent in human behaviour, particularly when such extreme actions are carried out by a child. It raises uncomfortable yet necessary questions about the nature of evil, the concept of innocence and how society should respond to juvenile delinquency. Mary's actions in 1968 not only resulted in the tragic loss of life but also sparked a debate that continues to this day regarding the treatment, rehabilitation and punishment of young offenders. In concluding this story, it's essential to reflect on the broader implications of the case. It challenges us to consider how early life experiences, environment and psychological factors converge to shape behaviour. Furthermore, it forces a re-evaluation of the legal and moral frameworks that guide our responses to such unthinkable acts committed by children. As we ponder the story of Mary Bell, several questions arise, inviting the audience to engage in deeper, conversation. Nature versus nurture. To what extent do you believe that Mary Bell's actions were a product of her upbringing and environment versus something inherent in her nature, the legal system and juvenile offenders? How should the legal system balance punishment and rehabilitation for juvenile offenders? Is there a one-size-fits-all approach or should each case be judged on its own merits? The moral responsibility. At what age do you think children can fully grasp the concept of right and wrong and thus be held accountable for their actions, prevention and intervention. 
What steps can society take to prevent tragedies like this from happening in the future? How can we better identify and support at-risk children before they turn to violence? Redemption and second chances. Do you believe that individuals like Mary Bell can be rehabilitated and deserve a second chance at life? How does society reconcile the need for justice with the potential for change in such individuals? These questions are not easy and they do not have straightforward answers. However, by engaging with them, we can hope to better understand the complex interplay of factors that lead to juvenile delinquency and work towards more effective, compassionate solutions for preventing such tragedies in the future.